Hey, this is a video about cardinals. Cardinals are there for measuring the size of sets. For the definition of cardinals, I will assume that you know what an ordinal is. If not, there's also a video about ordinals that you might want to watch first. How can we compare sets with respect to their size? One way to do this is using functions. We say that A has smaller cardinality than B if there exists an injective function from A to B. So this function maps every element of A to one element in B and no element in B is hit twice. It might be that not every element of B is hit. So this really matches our intuition what it means for B to be larger. And of course, this definition is familiar to you from finite sets. However, the point is that this definition makes sense for arbitrary sets. Note that I did not yet define what A in vertical lines means. I only defined what it means that A has smaller cardinality than B. So our next step is the definition of what it means that A and B have equal cardinality. For that, I require that the function is bijective. So in addition to being injective, it must also be surjective. Every element of B must be the image of an element of A under F. Before I proceed, I have to prove that this definition behaves as we would uh, expect it. What we expect is that if A has smaller cardinality than B, and if B has smaller cardinality than A, then A and B have equal cardinality. For finite sets, this is a triviality, and of course this is suggested by our notation, but it requires proof. And in fact, some of the first proofs of this fact in history were flawed. The fact carries the name of Cantor and Bernstein. I will present a short proof of it. Let A and B be two sets with an injection from A to B and an injection from B to A. We may rename the elements of A along the injection to B and therefore we may suppose without loss of generality that A is a subset of B. So the picture is as on the right. Let G be the injection from B to A. We have to construct a bijection between A and B. The key of the proof is the definition of the following set C. Let me state how to read this definition. We have here the union of the image of the complement of A and B under applying G a finite number of times. So for n equals 0, we obtain the complement of A in B itself. Then we have the image of the complement of A in B. And then we have the image of the image, and so on. And C is the union of all these sets. So in the picture, C is represented by the red area. Note that C is contained in B, and the complement of C in B is contained in A. This is clearly visible in the picture. Now we can define the bijection from B to A as follows. H of X is defined to be G of X if X is an element of C, and otherwise H of X equals X. That's it. So the idea is that if you are in the red area, you walk along G, and if you are in the black area, you stay, you stand. Surjectivity of this map is clear from the picture. Every point in A is either in the red area and therefore has a pre-image, or in the black area, and then of course also has a pre-image. And the map H is also injective. The pre-image of a point X in the black area consists of just X, and the pre-image of a point in the red area consists of one point by the injectivity of G. The existence of bijections is a very flexible thing. For example, the set of all pairs of natural numbers is in bijection to the natural numbers. A bijection is given by the following polynomial. x plus y plus 1 times x plus y, divide by 2, and then add x. 
it's probably not immediate to you that this function, why this function should be bijective. But if you plot the function on small integers, you will see a certain pattern showing up. We traverse all numbers diagonally from left to right, as in the picture. It is then not difficult to show that the function enumerates every natural number precisely once. And you might now wonder, aren't maybe all infinite sets in bijection to each other? Is it perhaps true that all infinite sets have the same cardinality? And the answer is no. More than 100 years ago, Cantor proved that the power set of a set A is strictly larger than A. That is, there is no subjection from A to the power set of A. The proof is a so-called diagonal argument. We define B as the set of all elements of A such that X is not an element of F of X. I claim that this set B is not in the image of F. Otherwise, if there exists an element X in A, which is mapped to B, then we have that X is in B, if and only if, by definition, X is not in F of X, which equals B by assumption. So X is in B, if and only if X is not in B. A contradiction. We conclude that indeed B is not in the image of F, and F is therefore not subjective. This argument in particular works for finite sets, so let's illustrate it over the set 0, 1, 2. The power set of A has eight elements. Let's have a look at some function F, and let's compute the set B for this function F. 0 is not in this set B because f of 0 equals 0, 1, 2. So f of 0 contains 0. So 0 is not included in the set B. 1 is in B because f of 1 equals the set that just contains 0. So f of 1 does not contain 1. So 1 is included. Finally, 2 is in the set because f of 2 equals the empty set. So f of 2 does not contain 2, so 2 is included. Altogether, we have that b equals the set 1, 2. And indeed, 1, 2 is not in the image of f. This illustration that we see is also the reason why the argument is called a diagonal argument. To form the set b, we walk along the diagonal. Whether or not an element x is an element of f of x is seen at the diagonal. The well-ordering theorem implies that every set is in bijection with an ordinal. The cardinality of a set S is defined to be the smallest ordinal, which is in bijection with S. We write S in vertical lines for this ordinal and call such an ordinal a cardinal. Examples of cardinals are 0, 1, 2 and so on, because these are ordinals with the property that all smaller ordinals have smaller cardinality are not in bijection. Another example of a cardinal is omega. Omega plus 1, however, is not a cardinal, since omega plus 1 is clearly in bijection with omega. A basic fact is that every union of a set of cardinals is again a cardinal. So you can view this as an exercise or you can find it in the course notes. We write kappa plus for the smallest cardinal, which is greater than kappa, we call it the cardinal successor of kappa. To avoid confusion with or the ordinal successor, one can write plus one instead of superscript plus for the ordinal successor. Now comes some important notation, the so-called Aleph hierarchy, to denote cardinals. For every ordinal alpha, we write Aleph alpha, for the cardinal defined as follows. Aleph alpha is omega if alpha is zero. It is the successor cardinal of Aleph beta if alpha is the ordinal successor of beta. And it is defined as the union of Aleph beta for all beta smaller than alpha if alpha is a limit ordinal. 
So Aleph zero and omega are the same thing. We typically use Aleph zero if we want to stress that we are counting something, and we are using omega if you want to stress that we have an ordinal. It is not so difficult to show that every infinite cardinal is of the form Aleph alpha for some ordinal alpha. We conclude with some computation rules for cardinals. You already know how to compute with finite cardinals. So let kappa be an infinite cardinal. The first statement is that kappa times kappa equals kappa. The multiplication here is the multiplication that we defined for all ordinals. Kappa plus lambda equals the maximum of kappa and lambda. Again, the addition is uh, the addition that we have defined for all ordinals. Finally, another useful fact is that kappa to the kappa equals 2 to the kappa. Actually, 2 and 3, item 2 and 3 above, can be deduced easily from item 1. We will illustrate how to compute with cardinals with the following example. We write a to the strictly smaller omega for the union over all finite sequences of elements of a. In other words, we consider the set of all finite words over the alphabet a. The typical notation in formal languages and computer science would be a star. What is the cardinality of the set of all words over a? We can count all the words separately by their length. So we have to compute an infinite sum, which we can bound by the supremum of the number of words of length n times Aleph zero. The supremum is zero if a is empty. It is Aleph zero if a is finite, non-empty, or it equals the size of the alphabet a otherwise. Here we use item one above. So overall, we get the maximum of the signature size and Aleph zero as an upper bound. And this is relevant in logic because it provides an upper bound for the number of all formulas over a given signature. So A plays the role of the signature here. The continuum hypothesis states that the cardinal successor of Aleph zero, which is Aleph one, equals two to the Aleph zero. Phrased differently, the hypothesis states that every set which is not countable has already at least the size of the power set of omega. It is known that if ZFC is consistent, then the continuum hypothesis cannot be proved in ZFC. Cohen showed how to produce from a model of ZFC another model of ZFC where the continuum hypothesis does not hold. Moreover, the negation of the continuum hypothesis cannot be proved in ZFC either. Already before, Gödel showed how to construct from a model of ZFC a model of ZFC where the continuum hypothesis holds. In other words, the continuum hypothesis is independent from ZFC. The same holds for the stronger generalized continuum hypothesis, which is the analogous statement for all cardinals kappa.